You ever get that feeling that your dad is just not really in your corner 100%? I mean, there's something to be said for a little tough love, a little pressure to stand on your own, churn your own butter and all that. But there's something more to it, something people clearly don't like talking about. But I'll say it, mothers are great for seeing to the needs of young children, and fathers are good for training up a young teen to eventually become a functional member of society. But there's something that gets in the way of this, especially in the modern age where you really have to grind for a long time and spend a lot of resources to get anywhere. That is, that the stronger you get, the more your father starts to see you as competition. Remember, he has 100% of his genes. You have approximately 50% of his genes. Yes, you may be young and full of more potential to spread your seed, but he he may just prioritize his own mating opportunities over yours. In other words, you should not fully trust that your dad has your best interest at heart. To better flesh out what I'm talking about though, let's get into some examples, starting with the Greek gods. Uranus was the elder god of the ancient Greeks. He was the heavens, while the female Gaia was the earth. Gaia was his mother, but also his spouse. It's kind of like the chicken and the egg thing if you just answer yes. So those two had three batches of children, the Cyclops, the Hecatonchires, and the Titans. He only liked his Titan children though. So he imprisoned his other two litters within Tartarus, inside of Gaia, which in fact caused Gaia a great deal of pain. So she plotted against Uranus with her youngest Titan son, Kronos. Using a stone sickle of her creation, Kronos castrated Uranus right when he was descending upon Gaia, and the blood and splooge that resulted from this were the seed for the goddess of love Aphrodite, the giants, the water spirits of vengeance towards oath breakers, known as the Arenes, and the nymphs of the ash trees, the progenitors of the warlike Bronze Age men. You could say these were his half-baked ideas for creation. Kronos would then become the dominant patriarch of the gods, and just like his father, he wanted to maintain his power and dominance over creation. Despite his mother's wishes, he kept the Cyclops and Hecatonchires locked within Tartarus, and he was especially paranoid over a prophecy that one of his sons would eventually usurp him. To get around this, he decided that he just wouldn't have any children, and when this didn't work, he decided to start eating his own children soon after their birth. Except that his sister slash wife Rhea eventually had the bright idea to start feeding him decoys while hiding away his children so that they would have the chance to become strong and challenge Kronos. This worked for Poseidon and then it worked for Kronos' youngest son Zeus who she hid away on the island of Crete, a very important location as Crete or Minoan civilization was sort of a stepping stone to ancient Greek culture. As a matter of fact, Europa, after which the peninsular continent was named, was a Canaanite princess who was abducted by Zeus, just one of his many, many conquests which symbolized the self-perceived potency and dominance of the ancient Greeks. But anyways, so Zeus grew strong on Crete until he was ready to make his move. He somehow convinced Kronos to swallow a potion, which he convinced him would grant him invulnerability. But in actuality, it was more like Ipecac. It made Kronos throw up all of Zeus's siblings. And only then did Zeus formally declare war on Kronos, acquiring his thunderbolts from the Cyclopes, who he released from Tartarus. What followed was the war of the Titans and Gods. Zeus would become the new king, and the surviving Titans would be subjugated. Now, despite using his powers, to sleep with mortal women all the time, even if they're married, Zeus arguably showed a little more restraint with his need for total dominance. That's not to say that he was particularly liked among the gods, but he did do his job of maintaining a certain balance. Well enough, in fact, that the few times he actually was overthrown, he would eventually be re-recognized as the king of the gods. And when it was prophesied that the second child he would have with the female titan Metis would eventually overthrow him, Zeus would cut out the middleman and all the motherly scheming and swallow Metis herself, although she would give birth to their first child, Athena, while inside of him. And and Athena would have a sort of second birth into the wide world through a hole in his skull. But basically his plan worked. There would be no son strong enough to overthrow him. And some would even question whether he didn't just give birth to Athena all on his own. In another instance, it was prophesied that the goddess Theotis would bear a son who would be stronger than his father. Zeus somehow managed to keep his hands off her and quickly married her off to her mortal man, to whom she bore Achilles. Zeus not taking Nereus for himself probably also had a lot to do with his wife Hera having actually raised Nereus, and thus wielding some influence over her. Now to make things a little more clear, have a look at this family tree. Note that Uranus, when he still had his balls, fathered all of the next generation shown. The Titans, the Cyclopes, and the Hecatonchires. Kronos would then father a fair number, and certainly the most central of the next generation, the gods of Olympus. Followed by Zeus, who was known for his conquests of mortal women and goddesses. I mean, there's just an its extreme disparity of how much more successful they were than other male gods of their generations. And they themselves had a very severe attitude towards it, seeing their own children as a serious threat. So maybe the ancient Greeks were onto something here. Uranus wanted to spread his seed far and wide and his sons could just struggle and take whatever scrap they can get beyond his notice. And that was his favorite sons. The rest he literally imprisoned in the underworld, like the Hecatonchires, whose appearance probably has some connection to the east, like the Vedic deities, the Bodhavista, 
Isaac Netero, even Bruce Lee was into it. The reality is, with 50 heads and 100 arms apiece, the Hecatonkeries were not only ugly to Uranus, but also threatening. In the war between the gods and the titans, the Hecas smashed the titans by hurling giant rocks, and the Cyclopes were master smiths, who forged heavenly weapons capable of taking down titans. So really, Uranus only kept the children that he thought posed the least threat to him and his power. Although I should mention in some tellings, he did also imprison the titans. He just didn't plan on Gaia plotting with one of these children against him. Remember that women are much less capable of spreading their own genes far and wide. With every child, it's a high investment of time and resources. Not to mention, historically, there's been considerable risk for humans of dying due to childbirth complications. But if she has a highly successful son, who usurps the position of his father, then that's almost as good as being king herself. Richard the Lionheart is best known for his participation in the Third Crusade against Saladin. But what about his crusade against his dad? You see, Richard was seen as the most competent of King Henry II's sons. But Henry seemed to keep shuffling him into unimportant roles while giving his brothers actual power. He even blocked Richard's marriage with Alice, the daughter of the King of France, likely out of fear that Richard would gain some powerful allies to usurp him. There was also some evidence that Henry kept Alice as a mistress for himself. Like he literally told the French King Louis VII that his daughter would be wed to his son in a political marriage. But when she was handed over for this purpose, he simply turned her into his personal toy. Now Henry's wife and Richard's mother was Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor was formally married to the King of France, but failed to produce a son in 15 years of marriage. As she was the Duchess of Aquitaine, these kings were interested in the sons that she might bear for them, because they can then weasel the valuable territory of Aquitaine into their own possessions, or at least their families. When Eleanor started bearing sons for Henry, she was adamant that this territory go only and directly to her children, which would have seemed fine if Henry was thinking in terms of bloodlines and the strength of his family. In one generation, they would have merged the rule of England and Aquitaine. But of course, Henry wanted it all for himself. This all came to a head with Eleanor and her three sons rebelling against Henry. But their rebellion was put down by Henry's men. Eleanor was in prison for 16 years, while Richard and his brothers had to beg for forgiveness, licking Henry's feet and stuff. One of his brothers, Henry the Younger, would later die of disease while on another campaign against their father. With this, Richard became the heir to the throne and he would eventually defeat Henry, become king, and free his mother. He was always her favorite, and she had long encouraged him to take out Henry before Henry takes out him. This was not unlike the relationship between Gaia and Kronos, or Rhea and Zeus. He was mommy's champion, and he was set to spread his mom's genes around England and France. Except, instead of that, he fucked off to the desert for 10 years. But it was actually during his final battles with his father's forces where Richard gained the title of Lionheart. Now lions are known for having a very harem style of social structure, where a male will have arguably exclusive access to a whole pride's worth of females, or none at all. When a new male, or sometimes a small group of males, usually brothers, takes over a pride, which of course means oasting the formerly dominant male or males, they set about killing all of the cubs of the pride, as they are not of their blood. This causes their mothers to go into heat again sooner, and it saves on resources for their own offspring, who they will of course tolerate, but their male cubs will be chased out once they reach a certain age. That's all the mercy they get for carrying some of the genes of the dominant male. Which, by the way, even if it is a crew of a couple brothers that take over the pride, there's still typically only one dominant male with exclusive mating rights. His brothers just benefit from the pride hunting strategies and may be getting it in with one of the girls when they can. Male lions who fail to find a pride tend to end up starving to death. As big cats, lions are basically ambush predators, but the big game of Africa, where they can get their real calories, is tough and dangerous, and better confronted with the team. So having some females who can get into sandwich formation can make life a lot easier. So yeah, those cubs and other male lions related to the dominant male will get a little leeway. For those not of the dominant male's blood though, there's no mercy. And you know, among humans, stepdads are far more likely to abuse the kids in their care than biological dads. And you know, in modern times, with the dating market being what it is, so-called polyamorous relationships are becoming more prevalent in the West. That is, a mutually agreed upon relationship between one woman and multiple men. At least in popular their uses of the word, that setup is far more common than one man and multiple women, a harem. Though the media does like to pretend otherwise, to provide a cope for these less attractive guys that resort to this. Like they already have a word for harems, polygamy. And these men are not like bisexual, they just take this deal. And when she gets pregnant, and then a child of one of these men comes into the picture, it can be rather tumultuous. Now, the stats on how children turn out coming from these kinds of families are still kind of fresh at this point, but I can point to anecdotal cases of the basically newborn children being beaten or even killed by one of the boyfriends or husbands. 
Like, and this is just an opinion, okay? I might be wrong, but that's not normal, even for stepdads. That's that lion shit kicking in. Remove the infant, not of your blood, to create new mating opportunities with the female. And yes, there does exist the female strategy of purposely creating paternal uncertainty to avoid this kind of thing. But when you're actually living with these other guys, picking up closely on their physical features and personality traits, she's gonna have a hard time leaving you uncertain as to who the father is. Now, I do like the nuclear family thing as opposed to just harems and incels. But if you try and bend the rules of important games in this life too far, these rules will snap back into place violently. And this is regardless of GMO soy consumption, it will happen. But back to fathers and their blood sons. The Chinese Emperor Jin Xiong, founder of the Western Zia Dynasty, was pretty well regarded as far as emperors go until he started to get old. Suddenly, he became more interested in women and drink than maintaining the kingdom. Now, Chinese emperors, like many monarchs, were known to keep entire harems of women to themselves. But that wasn't enough for Jin Xiong, who stole the fiance from his own son, Prince Ningling Yi. Like there was no scarcity involved here, he just followed an instinct to take from his son, who was enraged by this but only managed to slice off his father's nose in retaliation. However, Jin Zong's age and constant partying caused him to succumb to this usually non-light-threatening wound. William Rockefeller Sr. of what is now the Rockefeller Dynasty was a traveling elixir salesman who also made money by loaning to farmers with the aim to foreclose on their farms when they couldn't pay. He also pretended to be deaf and dumb to elicit pity bucks. I mean, he worked every angle. And sexually, he was very successful, having many wives and mistresses and many children. A regular Johnny Appleseed for single mother households. Now, with his two sons that he had with a woman named Eliza Davison, he would regularly try and cheat them and rip them off in every dealing they had and just brushed it off as trying to make the boy sharp. Now that claim may have some credence, I mean those were the skills he knew and could pass down, except for the fact that he abandoned this family while the boys were still teenagers, leaving them and the two daughters he had with the housekeeper to go be with another girl in Canada. It is said that the instinct to reproduce drives men towards great works. Not necessarily beautiful works, or works that have a positive impact on others, but great. But this instinct also drives some men to insatiably look for greener grass on the other side of the fence, not investing into seeds already planted, and just treating them as simple competition. And you know, there's a spectrum to it. Some men are more or less likely to invest in their sons as compared to themselves. And by invest, I mean more than just money and other simple resources. I mean connections. And teaching their boy as many core life and trade and other profitable skills as they can manage early on. In time, with these things, especially connections by the way, opportunities will multiply. But then he might have to deal with his envy over his young son's success and potential. I mean, that's just a fact of life that takes an exercise of willpower to overcome daily. Now, there's many ways for a father to weasel out of doing these duties. One cop-out answer that I've encountered is that by sending your son off to university, not necessarily paying for much of it yourself, they will do the equivalent of teaching a man how to fish, turning him into a 27-year-old bloomer. Like, I thought the point of higher education, at least ostensibly, was to gain the skills and knowledge for a good career. But that's where it ends. They're not going to give you everything you need to succeed in life. They're not your dad. Oh wait. But yeah, many more Weasley ideas are provided by the media because they seem to like weak sons and weak families. Like this idea, I guess you could call it a tradition at this point, that children should inherit their parents' wealth only after they're dead. Of course, the government tends to find a way to take a large chunk of it when it's done that way. But yeah, the average age of inheritance recipients is like 60. Like, thanks dad, you finally came through. <laughs> like that little nest egg could have been a lot more useful early on when it could grow with you. But whatever, I guess, who needs a 401k when you can throw your dad down the stairs? Now you've probably noticed this, a lot of celebrities come on the media saying how they have no intention of giving their kids any large chunk of their wealth at all. Which even if it's true, which it's not, they still provide their kids with extremely powerful connections, which the average man cannot manage. So it's not even the same at all, you know? They're just providing an excuse for deadbeat dads to be buried with their wealth like the pharaohs, instead of engaging in generational wealth, where every generation doesn't necessarily have to start over. Another thing I've encountered is that when a son gets to be a young adult, but he's still living at home, his father will start to demand rent payments. Which which, okay, if he needs the help, it's understandable. But more often, they don't need the help, and there's just supposed to be some kind of moral principle to doing it. But taking away that cut of money when your son is just starting out, and living at home, by the way, most likely in an attempt to save money. So it's literally slowing down your son's progress at that critical point in his life to, I guess, train him to pay rent properly. And I guess it is good training him for reaching in that wallet, because with all these hindrances, he can only hope to be a sugar daddy one day after decades of struggle. Sometimes, it's actually your mother who will ask you to contribute to the household at a young age, which is is typically a related issue because generally it means that your father is the type who just wants to spread his seed without investing in the family. And when your mother picks up on this, she will no longer see her husband as the provider, 
and might try and force her son into that position. No matter if you're only 17, she wants you to take up his burdens for reproducing. You know, this idea that most men have to go to university and grind for years without getting much pussy at all, if at all, in their prime, is largely a result of this. This unfortunate nature of many fathers to prioritize their own success and their own survival over that of their sons. You know, I actually think that fathers who live vicariously through their sons are not in fact doing a terrible job as parents. I mean, they get their ego fixed through their son's successes, and the net result is generally quite positive. And then there's fathers who try to harvest whatever success their son might have by moving in on their girl. You're drunk as fuck? And you want to crawl up on me like that trying to touch my girl? No, that's not how that fuck you. Yeah, you did! This theme of the father stealing his son's girl is low-key fairly popular, actually. You can see plenty of it in adult videos and hentai manga if you care to look. And I think it speaks to the current times and the boomer mindset where they're established but their sons are often struggling. And the idea of just taking their son's young girlfriend by wielding their superior wealth and connections starts to appear as closer than just a fantasy. You need to see this. You need to see what kind of trifling person you are. So get that phone no, man, man. you too. Who raised me? Because it ain't you. What you mean it ain't me? So what I do, huh? What I do? Listen. God, I know what I do. Get out. Get a real man, son. Oh, she need a, oh, need she need a real man. A real oh, so that's man. like that, Angela. Oh, Look at her. Huh? He take care of me. I, Where have I, you been? You working you all the time. I've been working. Yeah, yes. you've been working. Yes. Yes. So, so, me no so I can get back to you. Uh -huh. what? You might notice, for instance, that as a young guy, if you have a girl over at the house, and she doesn't even have to be yours, but maybe your buddy's girlfriend or your sister's friend or something, your dad might just start drinking heavily in the other room. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you. Chances are, it's because he's trying to build up liquid courage to move in on her. Some dads are less timid, though. They'll just go for it, especially if they can get her alone. Hi, Dad. Yeah, good. Where are you at the moment? Got the shot. Much longer. Okay. Uh, Hi, Dad. Another thing that generally insecure men tend to do is not help their sons understand women at an early age. Like how can you be masculine and succeed with women if you don't understand what femininity really is? You know like if you're an adult man who's really struggling and asking why doesn't anybody help me? First off, too bad you're a man. Second off, it was your dad who was supposed to help you early on. There's a good chance that you didn't get a girlfriend early and also that your dad never talked to you about women and how to get one and actually gave you money for the purpose of dating while still in school. The reason this is so important is because being at to and learning about femininity early will cause these lessons to sink in deeply and will result in a man who is more ambitious and motivated and overall masculine simply as a way to stay relevant in the female gaze and not fall behind. Fathers who are insecure and see their sons as sexual competition even in their early teens do not go out of their way to make sure their sons get this lesson when it matters most. They're like just focus on your school studies my little eunuch. What's that? You got no one for the prom dance? I cry for you. But back to historical examples. In the late Russian Empire, there was a trend informally known as daughter-in-law privileges, where the head of a peasant household would arrange a marriage between their young son and a teenage girl, although he would do this when his son was around 12 years old and typically very inexperienced with women, and then take advantage of that situation and his authority in the household to have the girl for himself. There were also cases where fathers would do this when they knew their son was going off to war or traveling for work. And you can be sure it's not just Russian fathers who sometimes do this kind of thing when given the chance. Why teach a boy how to fish when you can use him as bait to catch your own fish? It's just another expression of that mentality of prioritizing the spreading of their own genes over their own sons. Even if it means his son unwittingly spends a lot of time and resources on raising his father's child. <laughs> Instinctually, it's a similar concept to Jus Prime Noctis, the rite of the first night, wherein lords, and sometimes priests, would flex their influence and power to deflower a newly wed bride. They would then allow her actual husband to have her. But by then, of course, there was a chance that she was already impregnated with their child, which her husband would spend his time and resources on raising. Now think about this. How many bloodlines today are the result of this sort of practice? And not this exact practice, mind you, since I will acknowledge that some people claim that Jus Prime Noctis never existed exactly as described. It stands the reason that if this sort of behavior has proven to be quite successful throughout history, then doing so might feel more gratifying to some men than other methods to reproducing. So that, even if they're spoiled for choice with women, they might still gravitate towards this out of instinct. One more aspect of this is simply the reality of getting old and facing death. It can drive some fathers into doing some of the aforementioned wacky behaviors just because he wants to have a little more fun before it's over. 
And by fun, I mean the drive to reproduce, even at the expense of current family. In fact, there's a phenomenon known as the Laius Complex, wherein a father has a desire to kill his heir, so that he may have no successors, no constant reminders of the reality of his demise. I mean, if you can't find a certain fulfillment in it, because you're just not built that way, it does kind of suck to be training your replacement. Are you seriously cheating on me with my dad? You're a scumbag. You know, he lost all his money in the stock market, right? But you know, at the end of the day, the Reaper cuts off all our balls eventually, which might hurt a little less if a man can look beyond his own genitals. But you know, people get set in their ways. And it's better to accept people for what they are and work with that than to risk getting caught off guard, because your dad might just do his best to snip your balls or take your girl out of a wild instinct.